Hi there. Welcome to my space of make believe. I do words and you let your imagination do the rest. Now this story is part two of an American woman who marries a Chinese man in the 1900s. You can check out the first part by clicking on that. But this is a standalone, so you could watch this first too. Written by Sui Sin Fa, included in the book titled Mrs. Spring Fragrance, it is now in the public domain. And if you wanted to read it, you can look for it online. But if you'd like me to while you go about your day, it would be a pleasure. So if you're ready, let's begin. Her Chinese Husband, sequel to the story of the white woman who married a Chinese. Now that Liu Kangzi is no longer with me, I feel that it will ease my heart to record some memories of him, if I can. The task though calling to me is not an easy one. So throng to my mind the invincible proofs of his love for me, the things he has said and done. My memories of him are so vivid and pertinacious, my thoughts of him so tender. To my Chinese husband, I could go with all my little troubles and perplexities. To him, I could talk as women love to do at times of the past and the future. The mysteries of religion, of life and death. He was not above discussing such things with me. With him, I was never strange or embarrassed. My Chinese husband was simple in his tastes. He liked to hear a good story. And though unlearned in a sense, could discriminate between the good and bad in literature. This came of his Chinese education. He told me one day that he thought the stories in the Bible were more like Chinese than American stories and added, if you had not told me what you have about it, I should say that it was composed by the Chinese. Music had a soothing, though not a deep influence over him. It could not sway his mind, but he enjoyed it just as he did a beautiful picture. Because I was interested in fancy work, so also was he. I can see in his face, looking so grave and concerned. Because one day by accident, I spilt some ink on a piece of embroidery I was working. If he came home in the evenings and found me tired and out of sorts, he would cook the dinner himself and go about it in such a way that I felt that he rather enjoyed showing off his skill as a cook. The next evening, if he found everything ready, he would humorously declare himself much disappointed that I was so exceedingly well. At such times, a grey memory of James Carson would arise. How his cold anger and contempt, as exhibited on like occasions, had shriveled me up in the long ago. And then I would fall to the musing on the difference between the two men as lovers and husbands. James Carson had been much more of an ardent lover than ever had been Liu Kangzi. Indeed, it was his passion, real or feigned, which had carried me off to my feet. When wooing, he had constantly reproached me with being cold, unfeeling, a marble statue, and so forth. And I, poor ignorant little girl, would wonder how it was I appeared so when I felt so differently, for I had given James Carson my first love. Upon him, my life had been concentrated as it has never been concentrated upon any other. Yet, there was nothing feigned about my Chinese husband. Simple and sincere as he was before marriage, so was he afterwards, as my union with James Carson had meant misery, bitterness and narrowness, so my union with Liu Kangzi meant on the whole happiness, health and development. Yet, the former, according to American ideas, had been an educated, broad-minded man, the other just an ordinary Chinaman. But the ordinary Chinaman that I would show to you was the sort of man that children, birds, animals and some women love. Every morning, he would go to the window and call to his pigeons and they would flock around him, hearing and responding to his whistling and cooing. The rooms we lived in had been his rooms ever since he had come to America. They were above his store, and large and cool. The furniture had been brought from China, but there was nothing of tinsel about it. Dark wood, almost black, carved in antique, some of the pieces set with mother of pearl. On one side of the inner room stood a case of books and an ancestral tablet. 
I have seen Liu Kangzi touch the tablet with reverence, but the faith of his fathers was not strong enough to cause him to bow before it. The elegant simplicity of these rooms had surprised me much when I was first taken to them. I looked at him then, standing for a moment by a window, a solitary pigeon peeking in at him, perhaps wondering who had come to divert from her her friend's attention. So had he lived since he had come to this country, quietly and undisturbed, from 20 years of age to 25. I felt myself an intruder, a feeling of pity for the boy, for such he seemed in his enthusiasm, arose in my breast. Why had I come to confuse his calm? Was it ordained as he declared? My little girl loved him better than she loved me. He took great pleasure in playing with her, curling her hair over his fingers, tying her sash, and all the simple tasks from which so many men turn aside. Once the baby got hold of a set rat trap and was holding it in such a way that the slightest move would have released the spring and plunged the cruel steel into her tender arms. Kang Zi's eyes and mine beheld her thus. At the same moment, I stood transfixed with horror. Kang Zi quietly went up to the child and took from her the trap. Then he asked me to release his hand. I almost fainted when I saw it. It was the only way, said he. We had to send for the doctor, and even as it was, came very near having a case of blood poisoning. I have heard people say that he was a keen businessman, this Liu Kangzi, and I imagined that he was. I did not, however, discuss his business with him. All I was interested in were the pretty things and the women who would come in and jest with him. He could jest too. Of course, the women did not know that I was his wife. Once a woman in rich clothes gave him her card and asked him to call upon her. After she had left, he passed the card to me. I tore it up. He took those things as a matter of course and was not affected by them. They are a part of Chinatown life, he explained. He was a member of the Reform Club, a Chinese social club and the Chinese Board of Trade. He liked to discuss business affairs in Chinese and American politics with his countrymen and occasionally enjoyed an evening away from me. But I never needed to worry over him. He had his littlenesses as well as his bignesses, had Liu Kangzi. For instance, he thought he knew better about what was good for my health and other things, purely personal, than I did myself. And if my ideas opposed or did not tally with his, he would very vigorously denounce what he called the foolishness of women. If he admired a certain dress, he would have me wear it on every occasion possible and did not seem to be able to understand that it was not always suitable. Wear the dress with the silver lines, he said to me one day, somewhat authoritatively. I was attired for going out, but not as he wished to see me. I answered that the dress with the silver lines was unsuitable for a long and dusty ride on an open car. Never mind, said he. Whether it is unsuitable or not, I wish you to wear it. All right, I said. I will wear it, but I will stay at home. I stayed at home, and so did he. At another time, he reproved me for certain opinions I had expressed in the presence of some of his countrymen. You should not talk like that, said he. They will think you're a bad woman. My white blood rose at that, and I answered him in a way which grieves me to remember, for Kang Zi had never meant to insult or hurt me. Imperious by nature, he often spoke before, he thought and he was so boyishly anxious for me to appear in the best light possible before his own people. There were other things too. A sort of childish jealousy and suspicion, which it was difficult to allay. But a woman can forgive much to a man, the sincerity and strength of whose love makes her own, though true seemed slight and mean. Yes, life with Liu Kangzi was not without its trials and tribulations. There was the continual uncertainty about his own life here in America, the constant irritation caused by the assumption of the white man that a white woman does not love her Chinese husband and their actions accordingly, also sneers and offensive remarks. There was also on Liu Kangzi's side an acute consciousness that, though belonging to him as his wife, yet in a sense I was not his, but of the dominant race, which claimed even while it professed to despise me. 
this consciousness betrayed itself in words and ways which filled me with a passion of pain and humiliation. Kang Zi, I would sharply say, for I had to cloak my tenderness. Do not talk to me like that. You are my superior. I would not love you if you were not. But in spite of all I could do or say, it was there between us, that strange, invisible, what? Was it the barrier of race, of that consciousness? Sometimes he would talk about returning to China. The thought filled me with horror. I had heard rumors of secondary wives. One afternoon, the cousin of Liu Kangzi, with whom I had lived, came to see me and showed me a letter which she had received from a little Chinese girl who had been born and brought up in America until the age of 10. The last paragraph in the letter read, Emma and I are very sad and wish we were back in America. Kang Zi's cousin explained that the father of the little girls, having no sons, had taken to himself another wife, and the new wife lived with the little girls and their mother. That was before my little boy was born. That evening, I told Kang Zi that he need never expect me to go to China with him. You see, I began, I look upon you as belonging to me. He would not let me say more. After a while, he said, It is true that in China a man may and occasionally does take a secondary wife, but that custom is custom, not only because sons are denied to the first wife, but because the first wife is selected by parents and guardians before a man is hardly a man. If a Chinese marries for love, his life is a filled up cup and he wants no secondary wife. No, not even for sake of a son. Take, for example, me your great husband. I sometimes commented upon his boyish ways and appearance, which was the reason why, when he was in high spirits, he would call himself my great husband. He was not boyish always. I've seen him when shouldering the troubles of kinfolk, the quarrels of his clan, and other responsibilities, acting and looking like a man of twice his years. But for all the strange marriage customs of my husband's people, I consider them far more moral in their lives than the majority of Americans. I expressed myself thus to Liu Kang Zi, and he replied, The American people think higher. If only more of them lived up to what they thought, the Chinese would not be so confused in trying to follow their leadership. If ever a man rejoiced over the birth of his child, it was Liu Kang Zi. The boy was born with a veil over his face. A prophet, cried the old mulatto Jewess who nursed him. A prophet has come into the world. She told this to his father when he came to look upon him and he replied, he is my son. That is all I care about. But he was so glad and there was feasting and rejoicing with his Chinese friends for over two weeks. He came in one evening and found me weeping over my poor little boy. I shall never forget the expression on his face. Oh, shame, he murmured, drawing my head down to his shoulder. What is there to weep about? The child is beautiful, the feeling heart, the understanding mind is his, and we will bring him up to be proud that he is of Chinese blood. He will fear none, and after him, the name of half-breed will no longer be one of contempt. Kang Zi as a youth had attended a school in Hong Kong and while there had made the acquaintance of several half-Chinese, half-English lads. They were the brightest of all, he told me, but they lowered themselves in the eyes of the Chinese by being ashamed of their Chinese blood and ignoring it. His theory, therefore, was that if his own son was brought up to be proud instead of ashamed of his Chinese half, the boy would become a great man. Perhaps he was right, but he could not see as could I, an American woman, the conflict before our boy. After the little Kang Zi had passed his first month and we had found a reliable woman to look after him, his father began to take me around with him much more than formerly and life became very enjoyable. We dined often at a Chinese restaurant kept by a friend of his and afterwards attended theatres, concerts and other places of entertainment. We frequently met Americans with whom he had become acquainted through business and he would introduce them with great pride in me, shining in his eyes. The little jealousies and suspicions of the first year seemed no longer to irritate him, and though I had still cause to shrink from the gaze of strangers, I know that my Chinese husband was for several years a very happy man. 
Now I have come to the end. He left home one morning, followed to the gate by the little girl and boy. We had moved to a cottage in the suburbs. Bring me a red ball, pleaded the little girl. And me too, cried the boy. All right, chickens, he responded, waving his hand to them. He was brought home at night, shot through his head. There are some Chinese, just as there are some Americans, who are opposed to all progress and who hate with a bitter hatred all who would enlighten or be enlightened, but that I have not the heart to dwell upon. I can only remember that when they brought my Chinese husband home, there were two red balls in his pocket. Such was Liu Kangzi, a man. The end. Ah, what a tragic ending. You know, I have had encounters like this where people feel almost like if you were to marry out of the race, it is betrayal of sorts and then they are ashamed of you. But of course, few and far in between, but sadly, it still does exist. Well, that's the end of the story. Very tragic. But I guess she does have her memories and the kids. Hope you enjoyed the story. Thank you for joining me today. And please do come back for more. Till next time, go grab a book to read or a pen to write. And let your imagination take you anywhere. Be anyone. Do anything.